We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so I'm going to talk today a little bit about uh, Bell's, Bell Helicopters uh, design and manufacturing SMS implementation that we're going through right now. Uh, we've been kind of down the SMS road uh, officially for, for three or four years. Uh, it started with an AVS SMS. I'll get into that uh, in a few slides. <clears throat> Again, we're going to be talking about design and manufacturing uh, voluntary implementation that we're going through uh, with the FAA at the current time. So a little background on me. Um, I've been at Bell for 33 years. I uh, started my career when I came out of college at the Department of Energy in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Worked in the weapons uh, program division there. Uh, saw a picture of a V-22 in a newspaper and fell in love with the airplane and did everything I could to get a job at Bell and uh, was finally successful with that. Um, stayed on the V-22 program for about 20 years and then I went into the Six Sigma program. Uh, came out of that two years later, managed our uh, research and development portfolio for about five years. And then I went to India and built an engineering team in India, was there for three and a half years. And I came back and they asked me to do this. So I've done a little bit of everything at Bell. I think part of the reason they asked me to do this was because I, I'm pretty familiar with all the different parts of the company and I've been around, know a lot of people, uh, which really helps when you start undertaking something like this. <clears throat> so design and manufacturing uh, SMS, it's a little different than the aviation SMS that everybody's familiar with. What we're talking about here is managing product safety, specifically uh, the aircraft that we deliver to our customers. It is based on Part 21, just like the AVSS, AVS SMS is. Um, it's a flow down from the ICAO requirements. Um, we create, I was on a uh, industry team. We met for a period about 18 months to two years, uh, ended the middle of last year. But we created a document, National Aerospace Standard 9927, um, that was published last June, and in July, the FAA accepted that document as an acceptable means of implementing a design and manufacturing SMS. So if you use, you get a copy of that, uh, that document, you go by the, um, what's in the document, you will indeed end up with something that the FAA will accept. Um, the requirements, and th this is a limitation, I think, that we put in uh, at the FAA's uh, insistence, but right now those requirements only apply to organizations that hold type certificates and production certificates um, because the FAA just does not have the resources currently uh, to oversee everybody else. So there, there's nothing to keep somebody that holds uh, STCs, uh, PMOs, any of the PMAs, any of the other things from voluntarily complying with this um, but at this time, I don't think that the FAA will accept you into the voluntary program. So the design manufacturing SMS is going to become law in the 20, late 2020, early 2021 time frame. They're, they're uh, doing ex parte rulemaking right now. In fact, my point of contact that I'm working with at the FAA is the person that's writing that law. And right now, Bell is one of two OEMs that are that have officially had our kickoff meeting with the FAA, um, TC and PC holder type OEMs, um, and are fully engaged in the voluntary program. Boeing. Boeing. So they, actually Boeing had got theirs approved last year. They had some other uh, reasons for doing it early. Um, but. The, the team, the, the team, the industry team that met was uh, it was Bell, Boeing, Pratt Whitney, uh, Canada was on the team, uh, GE, Honeywell. It was companies like that, um, large OEMs. Uh, we had FAA representation, and we also had Transport Canada folks participating on that uh, panel as we wrote that document. <clears throat> So the next seven slides that I'm going to show you, we held our kickoff meeting with the FAA for our voluntary program in July of this year. And the next seven slides I'm going to show you are the slides that they shared with us at the beginning of that meeting and then 
we shared our implementation plan with them, which I'm gonna show you guys also. Uh, so this is kind of a, uh, a recap of what we did for the uh, kickoff meeting with the FAA. Um, so I, I think we're all aware, but the, uh, the FAA requirements are a flow down from the uh, KO Annex 19 requirements that flew into uh, 14 CFR Part 5 when that document was created, and that document fed into the National Aerospace Standard uh, that was published last year, uh, which right now the FAA and, interestingly, uh, the Brazilian authorities um, have accepted as a, an acceptable means of compliance. So um, either ANAC or the FAA will accept uh, those guidelines. <clears throat> So for the voluntary program, the FAA is going to manage uh, all of the effort out of their Washington office. Um, right now, they're only accepting uh, application proposals from PC and TC holders. And again, they're gonna use the standardized criteria for their assessments as they're described in NAS 9927. Uh, so strongly encourage you guys to get a copy of that document. Active PC and TC holders are going to get first priority. Again, that is because of human resource limitations that the FAA has right now. They just don't have the folks to oversee uh, a much uh, larger program than that. But STC, PMA, and TSO, again, you guys will be, any of those folks will be considered if there are enough available resources uh, to manage the additional folks in the program. <clears throat> uh, so the, the FAA announced the voluntary program last year. Um, they have a process, an FAA uh, process documented. Um, you can find that on the FAA website. Uh, just go out and search for SMS and it'll lead you to it. All of the applicants right now are gonna be administered through the national office. So they're not doing this through the local FISDOs or MIDOs. They're doing it out of the Washington office. So my point of contact uh, works out of the office in Washington. At our kickoff meeting, they invited the local FAA to participate. And they're going to invite them to our audit uh, when they come in to audit our SMS as a learning opportunity for those folks. But for these initial uh, implementations and audit reviews, they're gonna run everything out of, out of Washington for, uh, to try and keep everything as, you, uh, as uh, what's the word? They want everything to be the same because when you start getting, and I don't know how your local FAA, FAA is, but depending on who shows up on what day it is, you can get wildly different opinions um, and they're trying to nip that in the bud by doing it this way. So again, everything's going to align with uh, a KO Annex 19. Um, they have created an, ex an internal document. There's an internal FAA policy document that is, I've got a draft copy of it. It hasn't been published yet. Um, but that is what their auditors will use when they come in to assess your SMS when they come in. <clears throat> They're gonna do virtual assessments as much as possible. Uh, for Bell, we've got our initial audit set up for February of next year. So in about four or five months, they're going to come in and audit our SMS. After that, I think that most of our other facilities will be done virtually. Um, when, they, when they came in and talked to us, I was a little bit surprised that they're going to do the assessments by facility. So I, I initially thought they would come in and certify Bell's SMS and that we would have a letter of acceptance for all of our facilities. But what they're gonna do is, is come in and audit our headquarters facilities. They will issue a letter of acceptance for that facility, and then they will uh, do an audit of each of our additional facilities and issue individual letters of acceptance for each of the facilities. So uh, when we're done with this, we will have uh, multiple letters of acceptance from the FAA uh, for our SMS. Uh, again, I think the initial one will be on site, but I think the ones after that will uh, be virtual. And it, it makes sense because 
the tools that they audit when they come in to our headquarters facility are the exact same tools we're going to be using everywhere across the enterprise. Um, I think they're just going to be looking for some uh, evidence that those sites are using the tools and that they are uh, getting some data from those. Uh, there will also be subsequent uh, assessments. We have, they have not announced yet an exact time schedule, you know, is it 36 months, is it 24 months between um, audits? Uh, they will figure that out. I, again, I think that's going to be a resource uh, d determined by the resources they have. So uh, there will be continuing audits to make sure you're making improvement with your SMS, but we don't know what that timeline looks like yet. And finally, uh, when we're done with the process, the nice thing about the voluntary program is we will get a letter of acceptance that we can hold up, um, if anybody asks, that shows that we have an FAA accepted SMS. This is different than the voluntary program was for AVS SMS. They did not issue any kind of acceptance letters for that. Um, when we had the industry team together when we were formulating NAS 9927, that was something we insisted on, was that, that we had to have something at the end of this that we could hold up that, that showed that we had an accepted uh, SMS. <clears throat> so I'm going to move a little bit now into uh, the slides that Bell presented at our kickoff meeting. Um, if you get a copy of NAS 9927 and you start reading through it, you're going to find the word system description used a lot throughout the document. Um, it's, it's something that the FAA is going to rely on uh, for you to produce to describe your SMS, um, and that's what they're going to audit to is basically to, to your system description. So the, the definition of a system description, it's really um, all aspects of your organization that can affect product or aviation safety. So um, for Bell, and you'll see this as I get into it, but it's, it's clearly our integrated operations, you know, the folks that build parts, it's our quality guys, it's engineering, the guys that design, uh, design parts, certification is in it, our continued operational safety efforts are all included, all of our production facilities are included, but we have chosen to exclude things like finance and legal and most of the things HR does, uh, they have some involvement in our just culture process, but for the most part, um, at that level, we're, we're probably including about 70 to 75 percent of our employees in the SMS, but, they're, but one of the nice things about an SMS, you can also say what's not in your SMS, and when the FAA comes in, they're not going to audit that part of, you, of your organization. Um, Again, there, what, what you're talking about here are the systems that could directly impact the aviation or product safety. Um, and they affect the ability or the capacity of the organization to perform effective safety management. So that's the kind of things they're looking for. They're, they're looking for anything that affects the, the process that, um, processes that you might use for uh, design and certif certification to ensure that you have compliant products. Um, all of the production and quality uh, efforts you go through to make sure that you have a conforming uh, product, and then all of the uh, safety assurance efforts that you put in place to make sure that your continued operational safety of the fielded fleet um, is safe. So those are the three major things they're looking for. <clears throat> Again, I, I mentioned this on the last slide, but it is important to note that the system description is where you can leave part of your organization out. You very clearly state, this is out, this is out, this is out, and it won't be part of your SMS. Um, we have, at Bell, we are about a 50-50 military commercial product split, and since the FAA does not have oversight over our military programs, our system description has said military programs are not included. That doesn't mean we're not doing SMS with our military programs. We're putting the same processes in place for them, the same tools, but the FAA will not audit them when they come in to visit us. <clears throat> uh, 
And if you guys have questions along the way, please uh, stop me and we can talk about stuff. Um, you'll also, if you read through NAS 9927, you're going to see the term operating environment or operational environment used quite a bit. Um, what they're talking about there are all of the operational procedures that your company uses to perform any activity associated with uh, product safety and, and aviation safety. And what they're talking about is that safety risk management needs to be applied to any big or what they call substantive change to processes, procedures, um, locations. So if, if, if you make a major change in the organization, if you uh, move a facility or you open a new facility, if you change uh, responsibilities of people that are in critical safety roles, there are, you've got to ensure that they are qualified for the job, and if they're not qualified, that they quickly get trained so that they are qualified. Um, again, change, and another big one that's in there is changes to resources. So they're talking about things like layoffs, reductions in force, and I, I know at Bell, uh, we've been like everybody else in the industry, we've had a little bit of a, a downturn. We're coming back, but we had a, a period over the last 36 months where we had a significant reduction in force. And a lot of times after the dust settled and you went to see who was left in the organization, we found out that we were one deep or zero deep sometimes in um, quality people or safety officers or uh, R&M engineers. So some of those critical things that your company does, what the FAA wants to see is that before those decisions are made, somebody's taken a good hard look at who's being let go and that there is a plan to make sure that the functions that those people um, do are filled and, and that, that there's somebody there to do the job. So it's, it's not telling you you can't have the layoffs, it's just telling you when you do have the layoffs, do your homework ahead of time and do some safety risk analysis to make sure that you're not cutting yourself too thin in safety critical areas. The, the other thing we talk, one of the other things we talk about in our uh, system description is our goals. Um, and these are the ones that Bell has chosen. They're certainly not uh, anything magic. It's, it's the way that we do business. Um, the first one that we came up with, and I think probably the most important one at this point, is the proactive employee participation um, in reporting hazards that they see. So uh, with our union folks, with our engineers, it doesn't matter what part of the organization you're in, if, if you see something out there that, that you think could result in a product safety issue, we want our employees reporting that sort of thing. Um, we want everybody in the company uh, complying to all of the processes and procedures and policies that are out there for the company um, and make sure that uh, those processes are especially uh, enforced where we're talking about design, manufacture, and continued operational safety of our aircraft. We, we want co comprehensive safety risk management of compliance and conformity assurance processes. Uh, we're looking for superior continued operational safety and safe internal flight operations. Now, this, the, the internal safe, safe internal flight operations is not covered by a design and manufacturing SMS. Our internal flights are outside of our system description. Uh, we have voluntarily complied with the AVS, S, AVS SMS rules. Uh, over the past two years, we put that SMS in place. And I think if we were audited by the FAA, we would have a fully compliant SMS for our flight operations. So we do it, but it's, again, it's not in our uh, system description because we do not want the FAA coming in and auditing it. So this is kind of the way we have defined our operating environment. Um, the, the products that the FAA is interested in, again, for PC and TC holders, um, but it's folks that build aircraft, engines, or rotors, or propellers if you build airplanes, or if you build jets, I guess it's the engines. Um, but those are the three major categories they're talking about. Again, they have broken down 
the phases of an aircraft life into those three phases. So it's design and certification. That phase starts from pre-design and goes all the way through until you are issued a type certificate on the airframe or on the aircraft. Production starts with the manufacturer of the first production part for that aircraft and it continues until that aircraft goes out of production. So the, clearly there is some overlap in, in these phases. The third phase, the continued airworthiness phase, begins when you deliver the first aircraft to the first customer and it continues until you retire, surrender, or uh, somebody revokes your type certificate. So um, in a lot of cases, this lifespan of these aircraft can span 50, 60 years. We, I think we certified the 206 in 1960 or 61, and we stopped production about four months ago. So that aircraft had a service life of was it 60, 56, 57 years? So it can, it can span a long time for some of these aircraft. And, and then the process is associated with that. So the design and certification phase, that's where we are trying to ensure that we have a compliant aircraft. So the uh, design assurance system that we have in place is intended to manage that. Uh, for the production phase, that is primarily a quality function. Uh, so we, we feel that our quality management system meets most of the requirements uh, required for the production phase, and that's to ensure, again, that's to ensure conformity. And then the, the third phase is our safety assurance, and again, that's for our continued operational safety. And then there are existing requirements out there that govern all of those processes. So when, when we started deciding how we were going to implement our SMS. Um, when I came into this, I, you know, I did a little bit of homework. I, I kind of went off for three or four months, and I was asked to come back with what I thought the SMS organization needed to look like. And I came back and I said, it's, it's two or three people. It's, it's not a huge organization. The way that we have fashioned our SMS is that we are building a framework over the things we already did. Clearly, we have been building helicopters uh, since the 30s. We have uh, type certificates, we have production certificates, we have, uh, we have to keep aircraft safe, compliant. So 80, 90% of the things that are asked for in an SMS, I think, are things that everybody's already doing. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel, go start over from scratch, as you do your gap analysis, and I'll get into that a little bit on, on a few slides, but as you do your gap analysis, you're just trying to identify the parts that maybe aren't being done consistently or you don't have ties uh, between phases, things like that. But it's, it's not a major overhaul of the way you do business, uh, at least in my mind. Uh, so if you look at this chart, I've got those same three product phases on the left-hand column. The control systems are the existing systems that were in place at Bell before we started this process. So we have uh, design assurance processes and certification processes that govern how we ensure compliance. We have a quality management system uh, in place that ensures conformity. And we have a uh, consolidated safety council, a product safety board uh, that, that ensures our continued operational safety of our fielded uh, fleet that's out there. <clears throat> if you look at this diagram, it looks a lot like a bow tie, uh, because it really is a bow tie. Um, it, when I built this, I started off with the primary function of the company, which is uh, the delivery and sustainment of safe vertical lift aircraft. We couldn't say helicopters anymore because we built tilt rotors, and we may have some other things on the horizon that are not helicopters either, so we chose to say vertical lift. Um, and we have the barriers on the, on the left to make sure that the bad things on the right don't happen. And those barriers are the control systems I talked about. Over the top of that is where we're going to overlay the SMS. So again, we are not going into the processes and procedures that are in place and rewriting them and restructuring them or, and calling them anything new. We're just putting a framework over the top of this to make sure that uh, the SMS is really to monitor the processes and the procedures that are already in place. 
Uh, so we're going to, and those are the, uh, the uh, subparts of the SMS. <clears throat> and then after we deliver aircraft on the right side of the bow tie um, are the bad things that happen, the consequences. So when we deliver an aircraft, we either have good outcomes or bad outcomes. Um, bad outcomes are the things like quality escapes, non-compliances or non-conformities, uh, uh, accidents, rarely, but they do happen, incidents, near misses, uh, warranty data, uh, we're even looking at that, and then supplier notifications from our supplier that they had a problem with a part, et cetera. So we take the data, whether it's good or bad, if we get fielded fleet data, and we collect that data and we analyze it. Uh, we, we have a very robust process for doing that. Um, the other bad outcomes, we have a accident investigation team um, that goes and investigates every accident in the world that involves a Bell helicopter. We have uh, an in-house uh, component failure uh, testing lab, so any components we get of parts that have failed, we bring them in to determine why they failed. Um, and then, if need be, we issue service difficulty reports, airworthiness director directives. Um, and we have put our just culture in place to help as one of the recover barriers to make sure that we're getting, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to the real root cause of some of the issues when we see them in the field. And then all of that is a feedback loop back into the uh, phases on the left side so that we ensure as we build the next generation aircraft or as we continue production of the aircraft that we currently have uh, in production and we maintain the, the uh, safe operation of our, con of our fleet that all of that data is getting back to those programs so that they can make the necessary changes. Uh, something else you need to include in your system description is your product line um, so that very clearly you'll see these are all commercial products. We left out our military uh, products on purpose. Um, so this is actually just went out of date, the 206L4 uh, is now out of production. That was replaced by the uh, 505. Doesn't mean we stop supporting the 206, it just means it now becomes a legacy aircraft and we support it um, more from a customer support and services standpoint that we do uh, as a uh, in-production aircraft. You also need to discuss your facilities. Um, Bell is a fairly international company. We have facilities across the United States, uh, Mexico, Canada, uh, several locations in Europe. We have an uh, engineering facility in India, and we have distribution centers um, in the Far East. So we're, we are spread across the globe. Um, the ones that are in green are the ones that we have included in our SMS. So are clearly all of the, uh, the headquarters and the domestic manufacturing facilities uh, scattered across the United States, those are clearly uh, in. Mexico does some uh, manufacturing of large airframe components, uh, so they will be included. Uh, Mirabel in Canada, outside of Montreal, actually uh, does the final assembly of almost all of our commercial aircraft except the 525, which is are going to be assembled in Lafayette, Louisiana. And then um, our facility in India, uh, since that's an engineering facility, those guys are designed in, they're, they're involved in certification, they're involved in uh, design activities, they are involved in uh, quality and supporting production, and they're also involved in continuous operational safety. Most of our tech pubs are over there, so we've, uh, we've included them because they are such a big part of our engineering efforts. <clears throat> and I'll get into how we're going to go about getting those accepted. Uh, the other thing we did was made sure that everybody in the company understands their roles and responsibilities within uh, the SMS. Since uh, the design and certification phase and the continued airworthiness phase are both owned by our technology and innovation department, which until about a year ago was called engineering. Uh, they rebranded it, but uh, so our, our engineering department uh, owns two of the three phases, so that's where we have put the leadership for the SMS. So I report to the, um, actually report to the 
manager of flight safety who reports directly to our um, executive vice president of engineering. Uh, I think quality probably owns the production phase. Uh, they co-own it along with the SMS team. Um, commercial programs are deeply involved in both the certification phase, design and certification phase, and the continued airworthiness phase. Procurement is across the board because we build about 70% of what goes into a helicopter. We buy the rest of it, so we, we are very dependent on our suppliers. Uh, CSS is customer support and services, so they are very involved in, the, in actually gathering data from our customers in the uh, continuous operational phase. And then human resources and our communications department are involved in our uh, management processes and development, and HR is part of the process for our just culture uh, that I'll talk about in a little bit also. And we've also made sure that not only have we covered our functional type departments and our programs, but we've also covered the facilities. So the, these are the, the local DFW facilities. We've got um, a rotor uh, center in Fort Worth. We've got a drive system center where we build our transmissions. And we've got an advanced composite center where we build all of our thick laminate um, composite parts. Those are all in the DFW area. We've got domestic facilities in Amarillo, Texas, Lafayette, Louisiana, Ozark, Alabama, and Piney Flats, Tennessee. So we're kind of scattered across the United States there. And then our uh, domestic engineering facilities are scattered in all of those locations, basically. Um, and then our international engineering facilities, uh, primarily the US, uh, Montreal, Mount Mirabel, and in India. The, the roles and responsibilities is another key part of uh, NAS 9927 when you start reading it. They, they want a definition of the roles and the responsibilities of everybody in the organization that's involved in product safety. Um, so this actually is about seven pages out of our safety policy that defines everybody from our CEO and, and president all the way down to the individual employees in the company, what their roles and responsibilities are. So we have uh, started with the CEO, a level below that, we talk about all the executive vice presidents, what their roles and responsibilities are, all of the general managers of all of our different facilities, um, and anybody that has a key role in product or aviation safety, their job titles are specifically called out. Um, so the CEO, clearly he's, he's responsible for making sure that the SMS is in place, making sure that it's performing properly. Um, he's responsible for actively communicating why we're doing it and being a champion, a champion, champion of it. Um, basically, uh, making sure that this is a priority within the company. So uh, it's his job to communicate that we're doing this and why we're doing it uh, to the general population. And then all the way down to the individual employees, we have defined their responsibilities. So again, they're, they're responsible for making sure they don't hurt themselves um, or others. And they're also um, responsible for complying with the safety policy and all of the other regulatory and company processes and procedures. And they are also responsible for reporting any unsafe activities that could lead to a product safety issue. So you're responsible for following the processes and procedures, and we know they don't all work. If they don't work, we want them to tell us that they don't work so that we can fix them so that they don't have to be violating them. So. Uh, we're not totally there yet, but that's the goal, is to uh, identify those processes, procedures, tools, anything else we're doing uh, that could introduce any kind of safety risk into anything we're doing. So we have, uh, I'm going to go into a little bit of the tools we've developed. <clears throat> this is our confidential employee hazard reporting tool. Uh, this is an off-the-shelf product that we purchased, um, and we have made it 
totally anonymous if the employee wants it to be. So the, when they go into this report, the, the report comes up and the, the first questions that are asked are your uh, name and your email address. They are totally optional if you want to supply that or not. So if, if the employee is not comfortable providing their name to this report, they don't have to. Um, they can leave any of these fields blank. It'll still take the report. We prefer that they do uh, provide their name in case we have any follow-up questions or if they want feedback. Um, clearly, we can't get back with them if we don't know who they are. So um, until we gain their trust as, as we evolve and get better at this, um, hopefully the amount of the anonymous ones goes down and people start providing their names and, and get comfortable with that. But uh, especially with our union folks right now, we are not there yet. Um, the nice thing about this is it's, it's accessible from any computer, so you can log on to it from an iPhone. The uh, application itself does not reside within the Bell Helicopter uh, network. It's on a third-party server in Idaho somewhere. Um, so you can log into it from your home computer, or smartphone, a tablet, yeah. No, and it, it does make it more difficult, but we do ask um, down in here, you know, what, what function are you in? So if it's a quality person or, you know, where do you work? Are you in maintenance? Are you in engineering? Uh, we ask what program they're on. Again, these are optional, but we haven't had any turned in that they didn't provide a name, uh, but they've still provided this sort of information. So we can tell what, usually what program it is, and we can tell what location it is. So if, if we can't follow up with the employee, at least we can go back and say, look, this happened at Piney Flats, and it has to do with a 429, and you can start talking with the line supervision, uh, and they give you a description of what the problem is. So it's a different way of getting to the answer. It's not the best way to get to the answer, but uh, we'll, we'll, I'd rather they filed it anonymously than not file it at all. So the, the, we're, we're going down that route now. Uh, again, I hope, I hope we get the trust as we build this where we don't have to worry about that. <clears throat> um, the other thing that's in this report that's kind of cool is at the bottom we ask them to tell us what they think the severity of this is. So if, if Bell doesn't do anything about the issue that they're concerned with, what kind of impact is that going to have on the safety of our aircraft all the way from negligible, which means we're probably in violation of a uh, maybe it's a compliance issue or uh, we're in violation of a spec or something, um, all the way down to uh, critical or catastrophic, which means that we could lose aircraft or, or kill people. So we're, we're asking them for their opinion. Clearly, if I get one in and somebody has marked this, uh, we look at it real quick um, to make sure that, that we agree with the assessment. <clears throat> the other nice thing about this particular software is that it's customizable, so I can go in and create um, new reports from scratch, basically. That there are some templates provided, and we've been able to customize a lot of the forms, for instance, at our training academy. Um, they had seven different forms that their pilots were using and their maintainers were using, and we've been able to reproduce them in here exactly as they looked like before, so there's no retraining of anybody uh, for them to fill out those reports. Um, so uh, now they have one-stop shopping where all the reports are in the same place and they can file them all in the same tool. <clears throat> uh, another tool that we developed, and this is a homegrown tool. Uh, we designed this. Uh, this is available from a link on Bell Helicopters homepage on our internet, intranet. Um, but you click into this, and it's a safety risk management tool. So you can, w when you come in, this is the screen you see when you log into the tool, and it's got filters at the top. So if, for instance, a manager on the 525 program comes into this, he can type in the program, hit the go button, and it'll sort out everything except 525, and that's, it, it'll just show five, anything that's 525 affected. If, all, if somebody wants to come in, if it's a rotors guy and he says, I want to see everything 
in the risk uh, in the risk tool that has anything to do with the rotor system. You can go up to the aircraft systems and click rotors, and it'll bring up anything that is associated with rotors. So we can sort this data in numerous ways. We can sort it by is it in design certification, production, or continued operational safety. Um, where, what facility, so um, if we want to just look at everything that's happened in Amarillo in the last six months, we can look that up. Um, so we, I think we've got a really robust tool here. Uh, when I did the gap analysis uh, about, started about a year ago, but one of the first things I looked at was uh, how we were doing safety risk. And I went through just our official documentation, our official published documentation, and I found seven different risk cubes. So everybody across the company was doing safety risk, but they weren't using the same cubes. They weren't using the same language. We even had one where 1A was catastrophic and another one where 5E was catastrophic. So clearly, if two people on those different programs start talking to each other, they're not even speaking the same language. And that's what I'm talking about when I say the SMS is not a redesign of the whole system. It's basically to try to find the holes in what you've got currently and, and get those holes plugged. So uh, this took a while. We had to work with, uh, make sure that the guys in Canada agreed with the cube. It was something that they could share with Transport and that Transport Canada would be comfortable with it. We also made sure that our folks in Fort Worth that work with the FAA um, were comfortable that the FAA uh, would be comfortable with it. And then we've tried to roll it out to all of our programs. So I, I've purposely not gone out to programs and told them, you know, because they, they are doing risk now. A lot of them have got them on PCs. They're not even stored on our, uh, on a drive anywhere, which is scary. But um, so they're doing risk management. What we're doing, what we're asking them to do is as you move forward, with new risks we want to put in the tool. Don't go recreate any of the ones you're already doing. Manage those like you were managing them, but slowly as those get taken off um, of the risk, uh, out of the risk index, and, and we find new ones, we want the new ones put in the tool. 525 is using this exclusively now, and our continued operational safety guys, uh, product safety guys are using this exclusively now. Uh, if you click on this tab, it pulls up an executive level description of what the risk is. So it's got a brief description of um, uh, the name of the risk, the program, where we're talking about. It has a burn down that shows how we burn the risk down based on a uh, action plan that you can load. <clears throat> it shows where the risk was when we started. So the O was the original risk level. The target, that's where we want to move it to. And the X is where it currently is. So this risk that's in here actually moved one of the action items, moved it to a higher risk level for about two days because it was uh, something involved with flight test. Uh, and they knew that. So that it was just something with a heightened awareness. They knew that they moved the needle up to a higher risk for a very short period of time. And then they're burning, they burned it back down to eventually they brought it back down to the green. This is a little bit old. <clears throat> Uh, so we think this is going to be a great tool for the organization moving forward, try to get everybody operating on the same sheet of music. The other thing we put in here is a organizational risk ma uh, management tool. It's another thing that the FAA talks about quite a bit in uh, their documentation and what NAS 9927 talks about. So they're interested in organizational risk. So this is where if, if there's a guy out there that's an r and engineer, and he doesn't feel like we have enough r &M guys doing FMEAs or doing risk analysis or that sort of thing, doing Weibel analysis, whatever it is the r &M guys do, um, he can go out and put a risk in there and say, hey, I am uncomfortable. I think we've got a problem where we are not putting enough resources towards this effort. Um, and it gets put in the cube. A decision is made whether we accept it or not. Um, this also has a link in it if one of the questions when you enter a new organizational risk is it does it have a product safety risk associated with it? If the answer to that is yes, it creates a duplicate risk with the same ID number in the safety risk management database. So it, it automatically links the two together 
that there's an organizational risk and an associated product safety risk with it. So um, this actually uh, answered the mail for the organizational risk requirements um, for the SMS and also uh, when we did our recent, uh, we had an audit uh, for our QMS, they went to the, I think it's RevD now, and we just had the audit, but RevD all through that document talks about managing organizational risk. So this also uh, met the need that we had to upgrade our QMS to, to address how we manage operational risk. So when we started doing the gap analysis, um, we purchased a bow tie tool, and we, we started using this for our flight operations and our um, operations in general to make sure you know, that we were going out and looking at different places we were flying out of and that we understood where the hazards were and we were do, doing something about it. But as I started doing the gap analysis for the design and manufacturing, uh, Part of, part of our SMS implementation, uh, I took the tool and started using this as a gap analysis tool. So I, this one happens to be for the quality organization. Uh, my legal department made me gray out because this has document numbers, et cetera, in it. But So we took all of the things that could lead to the release of a non-conforming part. Okay, so it's things like uh, non-conforming material, uh, a production escape is something that got out of the factory, uh, FOD, foreign object damage, uh, deficient supplier parts that we find out after the fact. If we've got defective tooling, uh, we move production capability, so we were doing something in one factory and we move it to another one, well, that could be a risk. Uh, changing processes and procedures, so we've, we've tried to list everything that we think could lead to basically an escape out of our company to the customer. And each of those little boxes is a process or a procedure at Bell that's in place to keep that from happening. When you click one of the boxes, uh, you can go into it and it has a hyperlink to the document itself. So when the FAA comes in, I'm just gonna pull this tool up as part of the audit. If they say, what is that one? You just click on it, it pull the document up, we can look through it, see why it, why it addresses that issue. Um, it did help us identify, though, some of the places that we don't have great barriers in place. For instance, the newer change uh, manufacturing processes and changes to the quality system itself are not very well addressed. So we're going to create some documentation, some processes and procedures around that. Um, and then on the right side of the document, uh, as any good bow tie does, it's got the uh, consequences. If, if the bad thing happens. So if we do have a non-conforming part get out, it could cause a production flight test failure, an in-service failure when our customers have the aircraft, um, or non-conforming supplier parts or non-conforming bell parts. And then we've got a bunch of processes and procedures in place if that happens, including how do we issue service alert bulletins, how do we contact our employees, how do we get parts back in, what do we do with them when we get them back in. Um, but th this proved to be a great tool for gap analysis. So uh, if any of you guys have got a bow tie software, I encourage you to use it for the uh, gap analysis piece because it really proved to be helpful. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about just culture. Um, and we are in the process right now of rolling this out to our union covered employees. Uh, we've been doing it for Benoit, what, three years in Mirabelle? Three or four years? Uh, so Mirabelle is not a union shop. It is a, uh, it's non-union in Mirabelle, but all of our facilities in Texas are union. Um, so our, our rotor center, our drive system center, and our uh, composite center are all union covered employees. Um, so anyway, we, we do adjust culture anytime we uh, have an event uh, or a report, if we get something through the employee hazard reporting system. Um, they do an investigation, a root cause corrective action uh, type investigation. Typically, the, 
the local management, wherever it occurs, will do that investigation. If they want some help, uh, the SMS team will help them. And uh, when we're done with that investigation, we pull all of the names out of the report so that it's confidential. We then convene a just culture panel. Uh, there's seven to eight members typically on those panels. We do make sure if a covered employee is involved in the just culture process that we have another covered employee on the panel. We're trying to be as transparent as we can uh, with the unions. Um, we also make sure that there's an HR person uh, on the board. They are non-voting, so they don't vote on whether we hand out discipline or not. They get involved if the panel decides that they that uh, discipline is warranted, then the HR person takes it from there. Um, we also include subject matter experts. I, I think that's a key piece of your Just Culture team. So if, for instance, if I have an incident with a 429 aircraft at the training academy in Fort Worth, I make sure that I have another 429 pilot on the panel, and to ensure confidentiality, I make sure he's not from the training academy. So we've actually had uh, some of our Just Culture meetings, we've run them on Skype and um, online meetings where some of the guys have been in Tennessee in, on the 429 case as the subject matter expert. But he can see the slides, he's, he's in on the conversation, so it works very well. Um, but we do make sure that uh, we have somebody on the panel that understands what the, what the process is all about uh, that, we're, that we're trying to figure out what happened. Um, so that panel makes a determination of culpability. We have got a matrix that we have standardized. This is a published document now. Um, we base this on the Bain Simmons mom, model, so it doesn't look exactly like it. They've, they've got some lines going vertical that we have going horizontal, uh, but it is very similar to their um, product which they advertise on their website that you can go out and download and make borrow and steal, so that's what we did. Um, but using this matrix, the panel will go through the process and they will make a determination of culpability. Again, when we go into this, the employees are initially assumed not at fault. The review is confidential. We don't divulge names. And the panel goes through to figure out if the issue is with the individual employee, with supervision, with management, or with the company. And I will tell you, 99% of the time, it's the company. We find out that processes are unclear or that we're not providing the necessary tools uh, for the employees to do their job, and, or, or we've got them trying to follow a process or a procedure that is impossible to follow. So uh, we're finding almost across the board that uh, the employee is not usually at fault. Uh, one thing we are trying, and, and again, I said we're, we're in the process of rolling this out with our union guys. Uh, so we've been meeting and strategizing over the last three or four weeks on how we're gonna do that rollout. Um, and I think what we're gonna do is actually go back for the last 12 months and pull out every disciplinary action that we've taken against a union employee and we're gonna run that through our just culture. And we're gonna determine whether under today's rules would they have been found culpable. And if not, we're gonna take the punishment away. So if, if they gave some guy three days off without pay, they're gonna cut him a check for three days pay. If there's anything in his file about that incident, they're gonna pull it out of the file. They're even going to go to the extreme that if they have terminated some employees, they're going to contact them, and if they're not working, bring them back. So if we're successful doing that, I think that's going to go a long way with the union and building some credibility uh, with the process. So um, we're approaching this, working with the union leadership. We want to get their buy-in. We want them to take ownership of this, help us define the process, and then flow it down to the rank-and-file employees. And then we have a uh, bargaining, uh, next year is gonna be a contract bargaining year. And I think we're going to include just culture as a part of our contract so that 
that, that will also show the union that, that this is not something we're just going to, you know, flavor of the month that we're going to quit doing in, in half a year, that we're going to put it in the contract and it's going to be the way we do business going forward. So we're doing as much as we can to get buy-in from the unions and make sure that, um, that we have their commitment because it's not going to work without, without their buy-in. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about the gap analysis that, we, that we're doing. Um, I mentioned before that the, the FAA is creating an internal policy order. Uh, this is the draft of that order. Uh, Dorinda Baker uh, will be the individual signing it. But as part of this uh, policy, the FAA has created a standardized evaluation checklist for what the FAA evaluators are supposed to look at when they come in to Bell and start uh, auditing our SMS. So we took that document line by line and we created our audit for our internal gap analysis um, tool that we're using. So these line items match up with the line items out of the FAA documentation. We have made a, and this is notional, these are not all in this column, but legal didn't want me to put they where they were, so um, we're not perfect yet, believe me. Um, so what we've got here is these are going to be hyperlinks to the individual processes and procedures, so we'll be able to come down and say the designation of the accountable executive, we're going to be able to click that. It's going to take them right to the document, right to the paragraph where that's spelled out. Uh, and we'll do that all the way through the document. We're also making an assessment of our, um, our level. Present is that we have a process or procedure in place that says we do it. Suitable means that the FAA looks at it and the processes and procedures match the scope and complexity of the company, basically. Uh, operating, there's some evidence that we're actually doing it and using the data that we get from it. And then effective um, means that we are moving the needle and getting some desired outcome. So we do not need to be here in all of these columns to get a letter of acceptance from the FAA. They are fully aware that we're going to have stuff in this column and maybe a few in this column and some in that column the first time around. They're, they're not expecting a fully matured, fully um, perfect SMS. In fact, you'll, you'll probably never get there. But um, the other thing to note is in design and manufacturing SMSs, they have taken out the requirement for emergency response plans because those are typically associated with aircraft um, accidents. We still have those. We still have very robust emer emergency response plans. But again, since it's not a requirement for design manufacturing, we're not going to have them audited when they come in. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about our implementation strategy. Um, so this is what we presented to the FAA when they came in. And they said, yay, verily, this looks like a good plan. Um, so our proposed audit date right now is sometime around the 15th of February next year. Um, once we get acceptance at our headquarters facility, the FAA is going to come back in three or four month increments and start uh, auditing our other facilities. So they'll come back in April or May and do all the surrounding uh, production facilities that we have in Dallas-Fort Worth area. And over the next two, uh, year and a half to uh, three years, hit all of the sites uh, in the US over that time. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, there's going to be periodic audits, re-audits, uh, to reevaluate the SMS, but we don't know what that time frame looks like. So this is our, our uh, implementation plan. So a year ago, that part of the chart didn't exist, and it was back this way about how we were going to get the gap analysis done, uh, developing our system description and our implementation plan, and then safety risk management tool, confidential hazard reporting tool, a communication plan. So we have got a communication plan now. We have had several announcements on our uh, intranet, internal intranet to employees. 
Uh, we've also visited uh, every facility in the US, Mexico, Canada, um, and we even sent a team over to Europe um, and Singapore for those facilities. So we talked face to face with about 1,400 employees and showed them the hazard reporting tool, talked to them about just culture uh, and all of the, the, the other things. So um, we have started that communication plan. Uh, we are also developing a training plan, so it's kind of a two-fold approach. I'm putting together um, a train the trainer or train the facilitator type uh, presentation where I can go sit down. We're, gonna, we're going to designate an SMS person at every facility and on every program so that when we get a hazard report or we get a safety risk filed in the system, it's not my job to assess the risk of that and then monitor the risk. It is it's either the program's job or the facility's job to do that. It's my job to make sure they know how to do it and that they know where the tools are, et cetera. So I'm gonna be going around all the sites, sitting down face to face with, with I think we're gonna name, have two individuals so we have a backup. Get them fully up to speed on all the tools. They'll have administrative rights into the software so that they can you know, adjudicate, close risks, do things like that. Um, and then we are, the second part of that is we're developing a training module. It'll be an online module as part of our compliance resource center. So we have modules out there that we have to take every year on um, things like uh, government contracting if you're involved with, with government programs, appropriate behavior in the workplace, you know, sexual harassment, that sort of thing. Anything you can think of that has to do with compliance, we've got a module on it that folks have to take out, go take every year and then take a knowledge check at the end of it. And we have a record that they took that training. And we've developed an SMS module that will be out there for those employees also. And, we, and the nice thing is we can designate which employees need to take it. So if you're in the legal department, you don't have to know. But if you're in engineering or you work on the factory floor or you're in certification or any of those groups on a program, uh, you need the training. So uh, that will be done once we get that rolled out. That'll be an automatic process that renews every year. Um, again, middle of February, we're looking at our um, on-site evaluation with the FMF, uh, with the FAA. We expect it'll probably take them 45 or 60 days to issue us an acceptance letter. In the meantime, we will start planning for our audits at our other facilities, and that's just a burn down. Um, and I don't know why they made me gray that one out because it was really no information on it. But uh, these are just the facilities that we'll be doing over the next uh, few years. That gets us, the last one is in the 2021 time frame, so it'll get all of them in probably in time before this becomes law. Um, some of the things to note, the ones that are out to the, to the right here are our facilities in Canada and our facility in Amarillo. And we did that on purpose. Um, Amarillo right now is only building military aircraft. So there's no reason for the FAA to go out there this next year and audit them because there's nothing to look at. However, over the next 18 months, that's where the 525 production is going to be. So in two years, there will, there will be something to look at, and there will be a reason for them to go there. Um, and Mirabelle is the furthest to the right, and they actually probably have the most mature SMS in the company. They've been doing it longer than we have. But we are not clear yet who, which regulatory agency um, it's going to fall under. If you ask the FAA, they think they own it. I disagree. I think Transport Canada owns it. Um, but we're, we don't have clear direction on that yet. So um, I, I attended a meeting last week in Ottawa that was an international group that's trying to get some clarity around how are we going to get standardized um, SMS requirements out there. So we, we, you know, we don't want YASA doing one thing, FAA doing one thing, transport doing something else, and Brazil, for instance, doing something else. So those four regulatory bodies and a bunch of industry folks met last week. Um, and the, the plan is to try, try to get something as common as we can. But what, but what the FAA said is regardless of what comes out of the international, the effort to standardize the international um, regulations, 
the NAS 9927 is going to prevail in the U.S. So if you design to that, it's going to be good. Um, the Brazilians announced that they are also going to accept NAS 9927. So two of them have said yes to that. The major difference right now between the U.S. and the Europeans is that YASA is including uh, MRO, maintenance, repair, and overhaul in the design and manufacturing SMS, and the FAA is not. So that is probably the major sticking point right now. Uh, most of you know, the other stuff that we were, the differences we were looking at was, you know, the FAA calls them organizations and uh, YASA calls them um, some different name, but it's not, and they, they, the FAA refers to systems and, uh, um, and YASA refers to companies. So it's just, they've got some verbiage that's different. There's nothing really earth shattering about the difference uh, as far as I'm concerned and what they're asking for, other than uh, Europe wants to include MRO activities. And that is the end of my slides. Are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, how, many, how many reports do you guys get like a year average? So we rolled the uh, confidential reporting system out about four months ago, and we've gotten 12 or 13, so, and not everybody's aware of it yet. We, we still have some communication to do. Um, I'm hoping that when we roll out the just culture with the union guys, that we take another shot at rolling out the confidential hazard tool as well um, to get it better communicated. So th there is some activity. It's not to the level we w would like it yet. Um, but uh, we, it, it was funny because every time I would visit a site, I would get one within two days, but then I wouldn't get anything else for, you know, two or three weeks. So, the, the more they're aware of it, the more they're going to do it. Yeah, then what? Yeah, now we have our own standalone system for Mirabel and Mirabel, but uh, so we get for an hour a year today we have about seventy reports so far for just for incidents or more proactive reports, and we used to get like one hundred and fifty some a year, so but we had this downturn. So our, our, we have a current uh, root cause corrective action process in, our, in the factory where they, we basically do everything except they don't look at the human in the loop part of it, which is what Just Culture does. And as part of that process, there is a formal what you have to do to close it, and then you have to monitor it. Some of them, depending on what it is, you gotta monitor them for three years. It depends on the, the complexity of what you did to fix it. Um, and you know, the, the, the first discussions I had with, with, with the leadership in some of our centers, um, that we were, we have, we specifically, one of the recurring issues we have is backing left in composite material when they're building a part. So they'll, we'll get the part completely built, put it on an ultrasonic inspection, and go through and you can very clearly see that they didn't pull the backing off, which scraps the part. Or you have to go back and put a doubler around it, um, it at some expense. And worst case, sometimes it makes it out of the factory and the part delaminates on an aircraft. Usually it's panels that are not flight critical, but it's still embarrassing and it's still something we would rather not happen. And that is something that over the last two or three years, they have been disciplining employees. And the more it happens, the more they discipline them, and the more they discipline them, the more it happens. And we, we've had 30, 30 instances in the last three years, so clearly whatever we're doing isn't working. Right, so I, it's a perfect candidate for Just Culture Investigation to try to figure out, okay, instead of punishing these guys for doing it, it's, 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 I mean, it's either an issue of this is so frickin' boring that you've gotta have something else to help them 
you know, catch those mistakes or we have got to have a better process of inspecting or, you know, I don't know what the answer is, but clearly, yeah, we're not doing it. And this is not something that just came up. We've been building composite panels for 30 years and we've been leaving backing in them for 30 years. And I'm sure it's, a, it's rampant across the industry. It's, it's one of those problems that we haven't come up with a good fix yet. And we've tried a lot of different things and the numbers are not significantly changing. So it's those kind of issues that, that I'm hoping when we start including the human element in our root cause corrective action analysis that we start really finding out how we can fix the problems. And I think that's the kind of stuff that is what SRM is, or what a SMS is supposed to do, is, is to help you find those, those nagging things that you've been unable to fix, basically. So, anybody else? All right, well, thank you very much. Thank <clears throat> you.